Okay, we're going to cover um, section 19.1, which is about the fossil record. Um, so we're going to talk about two ways of determining the age of a fossil. There's relative dating and radiometric dating. Um, relative dating, so when you're looking at rock layers, um, the lower layers are older and the top layers are younger. So think about when you make, like, if you've made a layer cake before, it's like two or three layers. Um, you lay down the first layer first do some frosting, the next layer, some frosting, the third layer. So the layers on the bottom, we can tell are older than the um, top ones. The top ones are younger because sediments kind of um, build up on each other. So relative dating um, places rock layers and their fossils into a temporal sequence. So relative dating just means like you get an approximate age, like, oh, these um, fossils right here, or, or the fossil right here is older, than this fossil here um, in this third layer. So it's a relative at an approximate age. Um, to help establish the relative ages of rock layers and their fossils, scientists use something called index fossils. Index fossils are distinctive fossils used to establish and compare the relative ages of rock layers and the fossils they contain. So if the same index fossil is found in two widely separate rock layers, the rock layers are probably similar in age. Um, so for example, this fossil right here, fossil B, um, is the same as this fossil in location three. So these two layers are most likely probably similar in age. So a good index fossil um, is a fossil or a species that must be easily recognized and will only occur a few rock layers, meaning that the organism lived only for a short period of time. Um, these layers, however, will be found in many places, meaning the organism was very widely distributed. So this is a trilobite. Um, a trilobite is a common index fossil. It's a large group of distinctive marine organisms and are often used as index fossils. So you may have seen a fossil that looks like this before. It's a trilobite. Um, Okay, so relative age is important, but provides no information about a fossil's absolute age in years, so in an exact age. So one way to date rocks and fossils is using radiometric dating. Um, this relies on radioactive isotopes, which you're going to learn about more so next year in chemistry. Um, but to get some basic background here, they decay or break down in, into non-reactive isotopes at a steady rate, depending on which each radioactive isotope has a um, different rate of um, decay. Um, radiometric dating compares the amounts of radioactive to non-reactive non isotopes in a sample to determine its age. So this is based on a ha what something called a half-life. A half-life is the time required for half of the radioactive isotopes in a sample to decay. So after one half, half the original radioactive isotopes decay. So after one half-life, you have half of your radioactive isotope. After another half-life, you have a quarter of what you started with. After another half-life, you have an eighth. And then after that, you have a 16th and so on. So you always have this dividing by two pattern. Um, after another half-life, again, another half of the remaining. Yeah, so this is what we just described. So this is a half-life curve. You'll always see this like exponential decay pattern because you're always dividing by two. Um, so different radioactive elements have different half-lives. So here, um, if we're looking at potassium-40, which is a type of um, radioactive isotope. Um, the amount of radio, uh, potassium-40 present, so you have like 100% to 0% here. So you start out with 100% at half-life 0 or 0 time passing by. Every 1.26 billion years, um, so this is a very long half-life, after 1.26 billion years, potassium-40 will decay by half. So here, 1.26 is somewhere around here. Okay, so you have half of your potassium-40. Um, after another 1.26 years, which would be between like the 2 and 3 mark here, you have a quarter of what was left, which would be half of a half, and so forth. So you have this um, asymptote that never reaches zero. Um, so yeah, you always have an exponential decay pattern with a um, radioactive dating half-life graph. Um, Carbon-14, which has a relatively short half-life, which is about 5,730 years, it's used to directly date very young fossils that were previously living. So like bone, um, wood, 
um, elements with a long with long half lives can be used to indirectly date older fossils by dating nearby rock layers or the rock layers in which they're found. So generally speaking, a short half life would be used for young fossils. Something with a very long half life, like for example, potassium forty in the previous slide, with 1.26 billion years as its half life, that would be used to date older, very very old rocks. Um, probably you would use that to date things that were around when Earth began. So carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope, for, and again, you'll learn a little more details about this next year, but this is some background. Um, radio, carbon-14 carbon is a radioactive form of carbon naturally found in the atmosphere. Um, it's taken up by living organisms along with regular carbon, which is carbon-12. Um, so it can be used to date material that was once alive, such as bones or wood. After an organism dies, carbon-14 in its body starts to decay, goes through a beta decay, again, you'll learn that next year, to, into nitrogen-14. So you have this um, carbon-14 decaying into nitrogen-14, which escapes into the air. So researchers compare the amount of carbon-14 in a fossil to the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere, which is generally constant, the one in the atmosphere. So this comparison reveals how long ago the organism lived. So like, did half of its carbon-14 go away? Did three quarters of it go away? So you get an idea of how old this fossil is. So again, carbon-14 only has a half-life of about 5,730 years, which is fairly short, very, very short in the geological time scale. Um, so it's only used for dating fossils no older than 60,000 years. So again, you would use um, radioactive isotopes that have longer half-lives to date things that are older than 60,000 years old. Um, this is the geological time scale. Um, geologists and paleontologists have built a timeline of Earth's history called the geological time scale. Um, the basic division of the geological time scale are eons, eras, and periods. You won't have to memorize this, but you should be able to recognize like how to read from it. So, for example, the Jurassic period, um, it started 200 million years ago and it ended 146 million years ago. So we always start with the bigger number is when it started, and then the smaller number of when it ended, because we're going from how many year, millions years ago to present, which would be zero million years ago. So you should be able to recognize when a period or an era started and when it ended. Um, so to, to actually make that time scale, um, by studying rock layers and index fossils, early paleontologists placed Earth Earth's rocks and fossils in order according to their relative age. So they notice major changes in the fossil record at boundaries between certain rock layers. So that's how they are establishing um, this whole time scale period based on changes in the fossil record. Okay, life on changing planet. We're going to talk about how um, physical um, things such, um, such as like um, changing climates and geological forces have altered Earth as well as um, living organisms, how we have altered Earth um, in, in the past. So Earth and its climate has been constantly changing and organisms have evolved in ways that responded to those new conditions. The fossil record shows evolutionary histories for major groups of organisms as they have both responded to changes on Earth and how they have changed Earth. Um, so starting with physical forces here, climate is one of the most important aspects of Earth's physical environment. It's one that we are dealing with um, currently, um, Earth's climate has undergone dramatic changes over time. Many of these changes were triggered by fairly small shifts in global temperature. So during the global, like, quote-unquote, heat wave of the Mesozoic era, Earth's average temperatures were, re were really only, like, 6 to 12 degrees Celsius, higher than um, they were during the 20th century. Um, and then during the Ice Ages, world temperatures were only about, like, 5 degrees cooler than they are now. So it's... Um, these relatively small temperature shifts change the shape of life on Earth. So that's why it's really crucial now that we're seeing that um, Earth has, um, on average, higher temperatures than it did like even like 50 years ago. Um, we need to kind of control that because, again, we're seeing here we're at a technical heat wave um, in Earth's history, and we're 6 to 12 degrees Celsius higher. So the the temperature changes that we're seeing now are a little, um, a little bit scary, um, and we need to kind of get together the science community to figure out how we can control this and um, decrease the human impact on Earth. 
Um, geological forces have transformed the life on Earth, producing new mountain ranges and moving continents. Um, we'll talk, which we talked about with um, continental drift. Um, volcanic forces have altered landscapes and even formed entire volcano, uh, entire islands. So that's how like the Hawaiian Islands have formed. It's um, it's a volca volcanic um, activity on a hot spot um, where there's magma that's spewed up and it creates the islands based on lot like lava rock. Um, local climates are shaped by the interaction of winds and ocean currents with geological features such as mountains and islands. So different physical forces definitely have um, transformed life on Earth. Um, the theory of plate tectonics explains how solid continental plates move slowly above Earth's molten core, a process called continental drift. So when you go under the Earth's crust, we have this molten core that's like liquid, almost like liquid based. And it moves the Earth's core, the Earth's crust above it. Um, so it's like, like a almost like a boat moving on water. Um, so the molten core of Earth under the crust moves Earth's crust around. That's why we get like earthquakes. We we have the continental um, crust causing friction against each other based on these tectonic plates moving. Um, so over long term, continents have collided to form supercontinents. So here, like early on, we had like really this one massive um, continent called Pangaea. Um, later, the supercontinents split apart and reform. So here, where we have present day, so we see the continents that we're used to here have were moved and were actually like almost pretty much together. So when land masses collide, mountain ranges often rise. When continents change position, major ocean currents change course. All these changes affect both local and global climates. Um, so continental drift has affected the distribution, distribution of fossils and living organisms worldwide. As continents drifted apart, they carried organisms away with them. So for example, the continents of South Africa, I'm sorry, South America and Africa um, are now widely separated, but before they were very, very close together on touching. But fossils in, of the Mesozoic and semi-aquatic reptile have been found in both South America and Africa. So nowadays, um, you know, obviously they're separated by an ocean, um, but they were once touching and they had same the same organisms living on both. So now they're in completely different kind of um, habitats here. So um, that's a clue that at one point in time, South America and Africa were joined together because we have the presence of the same fossils on both continents when nowadays they don't have the same type of organisms inhabiting them, but at one point in time they were almost, you know, the same landmass, so they had the same um, climate and the same, were able to house the same types of organisms. But now they're apart, so again, a clue that South America and Africa were once together, another clue that we had um, continental drift and like a super um, continent called Pangaea. Um, evidence indicates that over millions of years, giant asteroids have crashed into Earth. So many scientists agree that these kinds of collisions would toss up so much dust that it would blanket Earth, possibly blocking out enough sunlight to cause global cooling. This could have contributed or not, um, or even caused worldwide extinctions like the dinosaurs. We've seen iridium um, in the Earth's crust, which is very rare, but um, so, it's mostly found in the universe, um, so a big clue that an asteroid um, with iridium um, cause was a major cause for the dinosaur extinction. Um, biological activities, so the activities of organisms that affect the global environments. So for example, um, there was little in our oxygen before, but we had photosynthetic organisms producing oxygen. Um, they remove carbon dioxide, which helped cool the globe. Um, and again, um, so an iron con content of the oceans fell as iron ions reacted with oxygen to form solid deposits. So that was a, a different change there too. So organisms today shape the landscape by building soil from rock, by doing like erosion and sand and cycle nutrients through the biosphere. So like carbon dioxide and nitrogen and phosphorus are cycled through living organisms. Okay, so um, if you need to go back and re-watch something or hear something, please feel free to do so. All right, thanks.